In section 0.7, I will discuss some of the aspects of the philosophy of science. Historically, science has its roots in philosophy. Philosophy is the study of questions regarding things like existence, knowledge, values and morality, logic and reason, the mind, and language. Throughout most of the recorded history, scientists were referred to as natural philosophers. It wasn't until the 19th century that the terms science and scientists became commonly used. The words science and scientific are used in many contexts and with many subtle but different meanings. Most specifically, science is a method. It is a method that tests ideas, and it does this through observation and experiment. The collection of facts, laws, and theories that have passed the test of science can be referred to as scientific knowledge. In general, anyone can do science. However, we typically look to our experts in a field to decide which ideas constitute scientific knowledge. Scientific consensus is the position that most experts at a given time agree on. Scientific consensus has can and will continue to change as we learn more about our natural world. Some people see this as a weakness of science, that our understanding of the natural world may be different tomorrow. But this is actually uh, what we want. This is, one, this is science's greatest strength, because all scientific knowledge is accepted tentatively, and that allows us to discard bad ideas to make room for better ones. We use several words to describe different types of scientific ideas. Because these same words are frequently used every day by non-scientists to describe non-scientific ideas, it can be very confusing for a non-scientist to understand what a scientist means when they use the same word but in a scientific context. Lately, the word fact has been used in a way that's inconsistent with the meaning of the word fact. Politicians and media have implied that one side has one set of facts while the other side has a different set of facts, and this cannot be. A fact is something that has really occurred or is actually the case. Facts are objectively true, regardless of one's viewpoint or perspective. A large part of a scientist's job is to collect and verify facts. Many times, facts make up the data that scientists will use to inform their ideas. You may have heard it said that facts change, and by definition, facts cannot change. Our understanding of a fact may change when we learn something new, but there's really only one reality, at least as far as we can investigate with science. And so facts about that reality are independent of a human understanding. The facts are what the facts are. An experiment is designed to test a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a proposed explanation for, an, or for a phenomenon. It is necessary for a hypothesis to be falsifiable, which means that you have to be able to disprove a hypothesis with an observation or an experiment. And it's important point to note that experiments or observations do not prove an idea to be correct. An observation or an experiment can only disprove a hypothesis. If an observation or the results of an experiment fail to disprove a hypothesis, then we gain a tentative confidence that the hypothesis is correct. But a hypothesis can never be proven to be correct. When sufficient evidence has been gathered in support of a particular idea, then we may choose to describe that idea as a law or as a theory. And because these words are used colloquially in everyday speech, there's a lot of confusion regarding the meaning of these two words in a scientific context. A law is a statement about a pattern that's seen in nature that is always true under certain conditions. Scientific laws state what happens. For example, you may have learned in chemistry about Boyle's law that states that the pressure in a gas is inversely proportional to its volume. And this law only holds under the condition that it, the enclosed gas is held at a constant temperature. Those are the conditions under which Boyle's law 
holds. And notice that the law does not explain why this is the case. Most laws in physics simply describe the relationship between two or more quantities, but it does not explain why the two quantities share their relationship. In science, we use the word theory to mean an explanation for some aspect of the natural world. I need to point out that theory used in a scientific context does not mean a guess or a hunch or speculation, which is how we frequently use the word in everyday situations. There are some criteria that any useful theory will have to have. A useful theory has to be falsifiable. If there's no way to prove that a theory is false, then there's no way to prove if it might be correct. For example, someone might say that they have a theory to explain why a dropped object falls down. That invisible, indetectable, magical fairies exist that push objects towards the ground. But how could we test for undetectable fairies? How could we distinguish that theory from another equally ridiculous one? We can't, which is why the magical gravitational fairy theory is not a very useful one. A useful theory must not be in conflict with other laws or other theories. If two scientific theories are in conflict, well, that means that at least one of them cannot be true. Generally, theories are going to include laws. For example, the kinetic theory of gases explains Boyle's law that I just uh, described using the idea that gases are made up of tiny molecules that are in constant motion. That idea explains the observation contained in Boyle's law. You may have heard someone dismiss a scientific idea as just a theory. Anyone who says this is confusing the everyday colloquial meaning of the word theory as an unproven idea with the scientific meaning of the word, as in a, an explanation that's backed up with lots of evidence. A theory is actually the ultimate aim of a scientific investigation. A scientific law is a great thing, and it helps us to understand how the pieces fit together, but a theory helps us understand why they fit together in the way that they do. It has ex ex explanatory power. It's a common misconception that a theory is an idea that still needs more evidence to be accepted, and that after we have sufficient evidence, that we can then uh, turn our theory into a law. But that doesn't happen. Theories can't turn into laws, and laws cannot become theories. They're two different things. Theories are accepted by a scientific consensus if they're supported by lots of evidence. However, all science, scientific ideas, which include laws and theories, can always be proven false or disproved by an observation or an experiment. It's also been noticed that good theories tend to follow what's called Occam's razor, which is a problem-solving approach that usually is paraphrased as the simplest explanation is most likely the right one. Basically, we've noticed that if we explain things in terms of even more complicated things, such as gravitational fairies, then we tend to form unuseful theories. We want to form useful theories, so we need to explain more complicated things in terms of simpler ideas. This example asks us to identify statements as either facts, theories, hypotheses, or laws. And I tried to pick some relevant statements about the coronavirus. In Part A, it states that the outbreak of the 2019 novel coronavirus disease, a.k.a. COVID-19, was first reported on December 13, 2019 in Wuhan, China. This is a fact. This is something that really happened, and this fact is in the public record. You can look it up. It doesn't explain anything or show a pattern. It's just what occurred. In Part B, it states, wearing masks can decrease the risk of a person infected with COVID-19 of transmitting the virus to an uninfected person. This is a hypothesis. It's something that we can test or we can gather data to disprove it. At this point, there's lots of evidence to support this hypothesis, so you might even be able to argue that this is a fact, but it's at least a hypothesis. 
In part C, it states, the virus called SARS-CoV-2 causes the disease COVID-19 in humans infected with it. This is a theory. It's a theory because it offers an explanation that a virus is the cause of the disease. Again, you could even argue that this is, in, this is a fact as well, in that it is the case that the coronavirus is the cause of the disease COVID. But this is, it is a theory that has lots of evidence to support it, so it may be a theory as well as a fact. In Part D, it states, when a pathogen infects a host organism, it will cause disease or illness to the host if the host does not have a sufficient immunity to the pathogen. This is a law. This statement describes a pattern that we see, but it doesn't offer any explanation. It describes what happens, but it does not explain why it happens. So in the last two slides, I want to give you a brief preview of the topics that we're going to be covering this year. Physics is the branch of natural sciences that involves studying things like matter and its motion through time and space. And we can explain the patterns in the motion of matter with concepts like force, energy, and momentum. Physics is the most basic of the natural sciences. Sci uh, physicists love to brag that chemistry is just applied physics and that biology is just applied chemistry. We say that jokingly because those sciences are important as well. The main goal of physics is to describe how reality operates by creating models, and we usually see these models in the form of equations. A model is just a representation that makes a relationship uh, easier to understand. And because physics seeks to understand all, at, all phenomena and describe the natural world at its most basic level, it's understandable that there's lots of branches of physics that specialize in describing different aspects of the universe. Be sure to watch the Map of Physics video linked here for a brief tour of the different branches of physics. This year, we're going to focus most of our learning on a branch called mechanics. This branch studies motion, forces, momentum, and energy. And these topics are relevant to all the other branches in physics, which is why pretty much every physics student ever starts out learning about these topics at the beginning of their physics education. And this concludes unit zero. Here I've introduced many of the skills that you're gonna need throughout the rest of the year. And in the next unit, we'll start some actual physics content by learning how to mathematically describe the motion of objects.